You're watching a Gospel Project Sunday School lesson from Redbud Baptist Church. Redbud Baptist Church is located at 801 Slide Road in Lubbock, Texas, and the Sunday School it starts at 9.30 a.m. every Sunday. Grab your Bible. Let's study together. All right. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody? Hope you all had a good week. We're in the Gospel Project. This is Unit 30, Lesson 4, and the title of it is Holding Fast to the Gospel of Jesus, and we'll be in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 15. And just to give you a brief summary of what the lesson is about, very much ties into uh, the sermon on Sunday, but um, it's the basic summary of the lesson is that it's it's a lesson about trying to keep us from being distracted. So Paul's writing to the, the church in Corinth about not being distracted and that there are lots of temptations and things. Um, and all that does is get in the way of us being able to hold fast to the gospel of Christ, to receive the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Um, so again, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 through 15, verses 1 through 15. All right, let me open this up in prayer. Father, we thank and praise you for all that you do for us each and every day. And we know that oftentimes we get lost in the, the background noise. Let us keep our focus on you, Father. Let us not be distracted. Help the Holy Spirit attach to our hearts, Father, and lead us to your Son's saving grace and to our salvation. Teach us the things that you want us to know, Father, so that we may be your son's disciples. In your name I pray these things. Amen. All right, this is Gospel Project Unit 30, Session 4. Title again is Holding Fast to the Gospel of Jesus. It is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 1, verses 1 through 15. And as I said, this one... Um, this one is talking about the, the things that distract us um, and keeps us from hearing the heart of the gospel, which is Christ's salvation for us, salvation through Christ for us. So in this one, I, not to say that I didn't like any of the other lessons, um, but I kind of like this one because I saw a little bit I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, but I saw a little bit of myself in Paul or a little bit of Paul in me or however you want to think of that. And what I mean by that is in, in this lesson, and you'll see Paul, the commentaries talk about it being ironic and Paul uses a lot of irony. At several times, I thought it was sarcasm because I use a lot of sarcasm at times um, in my life. And so I saw myself in Paul. I'm being sarcastic to these uppity people, and you'll understand what I mean by that when we get into the lesson. Um, but Paul's trying to, if you will, repudiate this one upmanship that's going on in the church of Corinth. And let me just give you a little historical or background information um, that will be very relevant to this. Um, and when I talk about one upmanship, the idea here in the church, and you'll see this as we go through these verses is that each individual is trying to, they believe that they're teaching Christ, and we'll find that they're not. Um, but what they're trying to do is they're being very pompous, very prideful, very, very arrogant in their skills and their abilities, not in those of Christ. And historically, what I mean by that is <clears throat> these, these speakers, if that's what we want to refer to them as, is they would actually go out into the crowd and speak uh, in wherever the speaking area was, and they would challenge someone to give them a topic so that they could show how intelligent, witty, and knowledgeable they were on a particular topic. And then people would pay to hear them speak because they were so knowledgeable, witty, and intelligent. Um, and their their rhetoric and their rhetorical skills were very polished because they they could logically go through the, whatever the argument was that, or debate anybody. 
Um, and so they were stuck on themselves. They were centered on themselves. And you'll see Paul tries, he starts off countering that. And then I'll show you where he gets a little ironic or a little sarcastic, if you will. I think it's sarcastic. The commentators and the commentations say that he, it's a lot of irony, but I saw sarcasm. So, um, cause he's trying to put them down, um, using their own words. So here's point one. It reads, hold fast to the one true gospel. Hold fast to the one true gospel. And it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And it reads, <clears throat> I wish you could put up with a little foolishness from me. Yes, do put up with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. Because I have promised you in marriage in one, to one husband to present a pure virgin to Christ. But I fear that, as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be seduced from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if a person comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we do not preach, or you receive a different spirit... <coughs> which you had not received, or a different gospel, which you had not accepted, you put on, you put up with it splendidly. And so right off the bat, you see in, in verse 1, Paul's using irony, because he's telling them, I wish I could be as smart as you, so just put up with my foolishness, because I'm not as intelligent as you. Um, again, I read that as sarcastic. Um, but the commentations, the commentators say that it's uh, he's using uh, irony. Um, it, it, he wants to, in the beginning, he plays plays the part of the fool, if you will, so that his crowd will pay attention and focus on him because he's not that intelligent. At least he puts it out that way by calling himself foolish. He's not that intelligent. He's not that knowledgeable. He doesn't have the rhetorical skills or the wit that these other people have. Um, so he wants them to look at him, and he'll come back to that in a second. But what he does is he ties this to the idea of the betrothal, where in the first century, Jews and Christians during this time period, the idea of the betrothal, betrothal being betrothed, um, where the woman is betrothed to the husband. And a couple of things that maybe we do or we don't remember about being betrothed is that in that year-long courtship, if you will, the woman is not living with the going to be her husband. She's still living at home with her father. There's no sexual relationships. It is still very much like being married, even though there's no, they're not living under the same roof. And we, we learn that because it actually takes a divorce certificate for the betrothal to be canceled, um, which maybe will help us understand why Joseph made a big thing about Mary being pregnant and he had not slept with her yet. Um, but the one thing that I did find is that um, the betrothal could be ended um, if the woman had committed adultery. And they call it adultery even though they're not technically married yet. Um, and it, they're not living together. And so in this message right here, Paul has presented himself as the father marrying the church at Corinth to the bride Christ or to the bride church. Um, and so it's his job, as it is the father's job, to protect the woman's or his daughter's virginity. It's also, Paul takes that upon himself and the seriousness of that to take on to protect the sanctity of the relationship between the here, the person in Corinth, and the church or the person with Christ. Um, and that's why the words are the way he... Um, he presents him at the end he says to present a pure virgin to christ so that that helps us understand that and then in verse three he goes back and i if you saw the sermon on sunday um i, I did mention that the bible is does not have a double-mindedness it does not have a dual purpose there's no trickery in the bible it is straightforward honest and truthful and Paul presents that idea here in verse 3. It says, but I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve with his cunning, and he goes on, and I'll talk about some of those things here in a second, but 
this idea of our devotion cannot be divided. It cannot be divided between the earth or the worldly things, and it cannot be divided between heaven and or the Christian godly things. Um, that there's, there's a devotion and a purity that's required. Again, going back to this idea of the purity. It's, and it's not an option. It is a strict requirement for us to remain truthful, or as the title of the point says, to hold fast to the one true gospel. We are required to hold fast to the purity of the gospel. We are required to hold fast and be devoted to that scripture. It's not an option. We don't get to pick and choose when we want to do this or do that, or we. Hey, I don't want to do that one today. That one, I'm tired. I don't feel like handling that thing over there, but... It's, it's not an option. Uh, it's supposed to be with a, an undivided devotion to the requirements of be, being a Christian and continuing in our relationship with Christ. And the reason the serpent is brought up because there was a double-mindedness. If you go back and read in Genesis and you read uh, in chapter 3 when the serpent is tricking, I think it's chapter 3, um, reading reading that and the serpent's trying to trick Eve, the reason she got tricked was because she knew what God wanted, but the serpent presented it as really, is that really what how you understand it? And so her mind became double-mindedness. And our, it's easy for us in, in our human condition to fall upon the easy, the, the simple, because it's the what's the world it's the worldly thing it just seems easier for us so it's very easy to do that but the thing that that Paul in his wording chooses here um, is about being seduced by the cunningness of the serpent is this idea of spiritual debauchery that's the idea of the serpent is the idea of spiritual debauchery and you can see that and I'm going to give you a couple of verses here and I'll say them twice so if you're writing you can write them down it's Hosea 9.9 9 and Genesis 6.11. That's Hosea 9.9 9 and Genesis 6.11. And in both of those, the word corruption is used. In Genesis 6.11, it says, God saw that the earth was corrupt and full of sin. And then in Hosea, it talks about man has fallen into a deep corruption. And in both of those verses, it lends itself and leads into the idea that because we've become corrupt or this idea of being spiritually debauched, that there will come punishment because of that. And it's not a will just because we're Christians. We all know because we know and are in the faith that God's judgment will come in the end anyways. And so Paul is pointing these things out to these people in Corinth that, that there's some spiritual debauchery going on. And what's led him into that point, again, kind of tying it to this, at the end of verse 3, you'll see it talks about the pure devotion to Christ, a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And then in verse 4, it, pick, it picks up and says, if a person comes. Again, if you saw the sermon on Sunday, I talked about, because I read 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. <coughs> And in, in there, Timothy, or Paul writes to Timothy about uh, hypocritical liars and deceiving spirits. Paul puts it in another term here in verse 4. He says, if a person comes. So he's talking about those people who are coming as false teachers um, with a false gospel of deception. Um, those deceiving spirits, those hypocritical liars in their attempt, like the serpent with Eve, to lead us away from the true gospel. And so the way we hold on to the true gospel is to measure everything that we hear that is supposed to be, and I'm going to put in quotes, biblical or scriptural, or somebody says, I'm a person of God, is the way we measure that is we measure that against scripture. And if it doesn't balance out, and it's there seems something to be wrong with it, scripture is right, and whatever they're telling you has to be wrong. And that's, that's how we hold on to it. And so if, if you'll go on in verse 4, it says you receive a different spirit. So when that deceiving spirit comes or that hypocritical liar, or in this case, somebody who's trying to flatter themselves with their spirit, um, excuse me, with their knowledge, intelligence, their wit, their rhetoric, um, if they come and they, you find it a deceiving spirit, you'll know it because you should not receive 
a different gospel than what you have received from the church. Scripture is honest, it's true, it's relevant, and as I said on Sunday, it is infallible and irreverent. Um, infallible and irreverent. Irreverent. Um, I'm lost for words. Inerrant. Inerrant and infallible. Sorry, I got tongue-tied there. Too many words ran together. Um, and then if we test it, that's how you'll know that you're not receiving it from a different spirit. So we just need to be mindful of our words, our deeds, and our actions, and even our associations. I don't know if the younger generation, I did to my sons. I don't know if my sons will do it to their children. But those of us that are my age or a little older, we always heard our parents say that we were guilty by association. So we just need to be careful who we're associating with so that that spirit or character of that person doesn't fall upon us and then we fall away from the we fall away from scripture remember we're always going to test we're going to test everything against scripture and then we will find out whether that that teaching or that proposed or supposed doctrine actually meshes out and marries up to the scripture and that's what Paul is trying to tell. He's, he's telling them, you're just going to have to put up with my foolishness while I go through this because I'm not as smart as you. I'm not as knowledgeable as you. I don't have the rhetorical skills of you. I don't have the wit of you. Um, but please put up with my foolishness. And then he logically leads them through those, through those uh, verses there. Before we go to point two, let me give you the fill in the blanks if you're writing those down. And I'll read them real slow. It's titled Bride of Christ. The church is described as the Bride of Christ, faithfully waiting for the day when Christ will return and heaven and earth will be one. Made up of all believers from all tongues and nations, the church is the bride that Christ redeemed. So here are the blanks. Waiting, tongues, nations and then redeemed so and i just i want to give you this this other point it's it's a question in your quarterly so it's it's on uh well my page number is different than yours i'm going to assume it's around 122 or someplace in there but the question is it says what are some other gospels pre people proclaim you have the gospel of self-righteous, achieved through good works, good works. Jesus who affirms people in their sin instead of calling them out of it. So it's okay to be where you're at rather than being out of your sin. Spirit of pluralism, everything is acceptable. And we are our own gods and our own salvation is found with each one of us doing what is in our hearts. And I think, again, and I don't mean to keep referencing it, but if you go back to the sermon on, on Sunday, those were the myths that I talked about. Um, and they're just put in a different, different form here at the end of this point in point one. All right, point two. It's titled, Rely on God's Power to Share the Gospel. 2 Corinthians 11, 5 through 11. So 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 5 through 11, and it's titled, Rely on God's Power to Share the Gospel. Now I consider myself in no way superior to those super apostles. Even if I am untrained in public speaking, I am certainly not untrained in knowledge. Indeed, we have in every way made that clear to you in everything. Or did I commit a sin by humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by taking pay from them to minister to you. When I was present with you and in need, I did not burden anyone, since the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. I have kept myself and will keep myself from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of Achai. 
Why? Because I don't love you. God knows I do. So this starts off with Paul. He's kind of taking, this is where I think the sarcasm really ties in. Um, he's first debunking the notion in, in uh, verse 5 um, that he is inferior to them in any way. He does concede that he may be untrained in public speaking, but he's not untrained in knowledge and wisdom. But his knowledge and wisdom is not based upon him or man. It's based upon God. And that's where he'll, you see in verse 5, he throws out this notion of super apostle, like they are something more special than the apostles who receive their message directly from the Christ. <coughs> Christ presented his message directly to the apostles. Paul is part of that because he, he met Christ on the road to Damascus. And so he calls it out. And you'll notice, at least in the quarterly, I don't remember if it was. Um, yeah, even in my Bible, it's in quotes, super apostles. Um, he's leading the notion that he's not inferior, that he is an apostle, and that these people are not smarter than him in any way, shape, or form. But what he's really pointing out, and again, this is why I think it's more sarcasm than irony, is that um, he's really calling them pseudo-apostles, that they're not really apostles at all, that they're false, that they're agents of Satan, agents of the darkness, that they're presenting this false gospel in the appearance, like the serpent in the garden, in their appearance of being within the scripture, but they're actually not in the scripture. And then in verse 7, he goes on and talks about... Um, or did I commit a sin by humbling myself and so so that uh, you might be exalted? So he's asking him, because remember, at the outset in point one, or even before point one, I mentioned the fact that these speakers would like to go down to the crowd and challenge him. Tell me something, ask me a topic, and then I'll talk on it, and I'll pontificate, and I'll be full of myself, and I'll be pompous and arrogant, and because I know I'll pound my chest, and I'll, I know so much. And Paul is saying that he's not been that way. And is that why they're beginning to look down upon him? Because he's not been pompous and standing uh, you know, on the, on the podium, wherever it is, pounding on his chest saying, hey, look at me, I'm, I'm better than everybody else. I'm a super apostle. And so he's telling them that they're, they're not super apostles, they're pseudo apostles. Um, that they're, they're, claim, they're making their claim um, preaching this in sin, um, out of pride, and not out of love. And so, they're at, Paul's asking him them in this point is because I've lowered myself beneath you. Does that mean I'm beneath you, and I, I've exalted you? What he's teaching them is the lesson of servitude, and that's what the message of Christ is: is that we're supposed to empty ourselves and humble ourselves to the message of Christ and to Scripture, and to all those that we come in contact with. It doesn't mean that we're lower than somebody because we're a servant to that person. And I think oftentimes in the world that becomes quite often the understanding. It's taken as a weakness because I humble myself and I teach the message of Christ and I teach it in a humble spirit and I try to teach it in. Uh, and I'm not talking about me, I, I'm just I, whoever, the, the Christian, it's often received as, well, you're a weakling. Christ is weak. Um, and Paul's actually, again, being sarcastic. And I would argue when I read this that, that he's kind of flipping it on him and telling him that that's what the message of, message of uh, Christ is about, is about being humble and being a servant and doing for others. Like when he washes the feet of the, of the apostles and they, they kind of step back and they're a little worried about, hey, don't do that. You're the boss. Um, but that's not his message. But what he does, and I think he probably changed his tone here. At least that's how I read it. In verse 8, he says, I did those things, but I robbed other churches because I was not ministering to them. I was ministering to you, and yet they cared for me. I took my care from Macedonia while I was here in Corinth. I'm not going to burden you. And that idea of burden is more than a financial burden. He's talking about he's, he's in partnership with Macedonia to minister to the church in Corinth. And it should be a partnership between Corinth and him 
while he's in Corinth, but it's not turned out that way. So that partnership is in furthering the gospel. Macedonia is helping him further the gospel, but the church in Corinth is not assisting in that furthering of the gospel. They're actually, as I said earlier, they're, they're falling into this spiritual debauchery um, symbolized by the snake, uh, the serpent. He used the word serpent in the first point. <coughs> because again, his giving and receiving was from the patronage of Macedonia. Um, and so again, he just reminds them of that. When again, going back real quickly to the idea of the super apostles, Paul didn't boast about his education skills or his Jewish pedigree. We know, and I think it's in Romans, it's in, uh, he talks about, I am probably the Jewish of the Jews and the Sadducees of the, of the Pharisees of the Pharisees. Um, because he was trained by the one of the great legends in Jewish um, scholarly works, um, and his heritage was was that way. Um, so what he's telling them is like we learn in Philippians is that we can't boast. We don't do anything by our strength. We do it through the strength of Christ, and that's what he's trying to remind them of. Um, and I'm going to ask this question. It, it is in the quarterly, and you can go you can go find it and then think about it later. Um, the question is: It says, "Which do you think is more prized in our culture? Which do you think is more prized in our culture? Elegance or knowledge? And then why?" And I would challenge you as you watch this to to think about that for a little while. And I'm going to cheat, and I hope I don't influence your your decision. Um, but I checked elegance. Uh, eloquence, eloquence, and I would say that based upon um, the frustration that I've I've experienced or heard people, because I am a high school teacher. Um, when they talk, when you talk to people about politics and government and stuff like that, they always talk about well, they say what they want to want, what they want me to hear, but when they get in office, they do whatever they want, and so. A lot of times I would argue that we really fall into the eloquence. That's we, we, oh, that sounds really good. Again, going to the simplicity of our nature um, and the serpent plays, Satan plays on that, that earthly understanding um, rather than knowledge because we, we look at speech and then we're mad at our politicians when they don't, their actions don't reflect their speech. Um, I know several individuals who claim to be of one political party or the other, but they don't adhere to the tenets of that political party from either either left or right. It doesn't really matter. And their faith doesn't match what they say they are um, because the world gets in the way. Uh, so I, that's that's mine. You, you, if you have a different one, let me know. If you think knowledge is, let me know and let me know why. Um, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's just I think we focus too much on speech and not we don't look at people's actions. Um, which kind of runs contrary to us telling us don't guilt by association because that's an action thing. Or appearance. You know, don't hang around with a certain person because of their appearance. All right, point three. This is confront those who preach a false gospel. Confront those who preach a false gospel. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 11, I'm sorry, 12 through 15. 12 through 15. But I will continue to do what I am doing in order to deny any opportunity to those who want to be regarded as, my, as our equals in what they boast about. For such people are false prophets, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no great surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as ser ser servants, oh, I apologize, servants of righteousness. Their end will be according to their works. 
Let me read the, the voices of church history, and I'm not going to read it all. It's Cicero of Jerusalem, and it's he lived uh, 313 to 386 A.D. And I thought this was very uh, appropriate for what the lesson, this portion of the lesson is about. It says, we therefore need the grace of God, a sober mind and watchful eyes, so as not to eat the tares for wheat and come to harm for not knowing better. So eating the chafe rather than the wheat, we put it that way. So we're going to, and then not being wise and mindful of that. And that's the, that's the message that Paul is trying to teach us for those that teach the false gospel. It is our duty and responsibility to confront. But I think one of the things that we have to remember is that it has to be in the love of Christ. And I know sometimes that's hard because people, when they attack Christianity, or they attack your values because you're not open, you're old-fashioned. Um, who says, and this is not me, this is one of the worldly arguments, who said Jesus is the only way to God or heaven? Um, who says that I can't do good works and work my way into heaven? And they oftentimes, and it, I know it sometimes it's hard, but and and I'm not, I'm not condemning anybody because I'm probably real swift with my tongue, um, though I work on it. We often get attacked, beguiled, belittled, much like this lesson started out, um, ridiculed, um, like Paul talks about being told that we're unintelligent or non-intelligent. We have no intelligence. Um, we have no wisdom. We don't understand. We're old-fashioned. I mean, there's a whole long list of things. Um, but when we do defend the gospel, we have to defend it like Christ would have defended it, in loving, mercy, offering grace. Um, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, the, these false prophets these deceitful workers, or as I read in 1 Timothy on Sunday, the hypocritical liars and deceiving spirits. We have to just present the message. And I think sometimes the reason we get frustrated is that we take our defense, or if you will, evangelism or apologetics, which is the defense of the gospel. We often take that as it has to be an event. I'm going to say it right now, and you're going to be converted immediately. What we need to remember is that it's a process, just like farming is a process. How many times does Paul use the example of farming or being an athlete? You just don't one day wake up and you say, I'm going to be the best basketball player or the best quarterback in football or baseball. I'm going to be the best pitcher. It's a length of time, and it takes a lot of practice. <coughs> Evangelism is the same. Pro it's a process. It's not an. It's not an immediate. You may get lucky and find that one, but that's you. How many people came before them? How many times did they hear the message in a loving manner before you came along and presented it to them? And then the the light bulb, proverbial light bulb, came on, and they said, "Oh my gosh, I understand now, and I do accept." You may be the first time anybody has presented the message to him. You may be the first time. That they've heard that message in a loving tone rather than having the Bible thrust upon them as a club beating them because of its moral code. Which it is. I'm not saying it's not, but we we can't we can't take it as a club and pound somebody into submission. The Holy Spirit, faith, grace, mercy has to be received voluntarily and freely. Otherwise, it's not really received. You can't force somebody into submission. They have to submit because the light bulbs come on. They understand the grace, the mercy, the love. That, but they have to see it in us when we're presenting it. And we have to know, again, Philippians, that it's not our strength that's going to do the conversion. It's not our strength that's going to present the message. I mean, go back in Old Testament and, and look at Moses. How many times did he try to get God to, to say all these excuses why he couldn't do something? And God says, I got you. I got you. We'll use your brother Aaron. He'll talk for you. 
God will give us the message when it's and the, the words that we need to say. They don't always have to be. I think oftentimes when we present our our message to defeat the false gospel, we think we have to present it in these like a pastor would. Um, and, a, and a fairly old pastor who's very well versed in all the theology and apologetics and the divinity and all the other Christian $10 words when maybe a 50 cent word will work on this person. And that's your vocabulary. And that's the reason God has presented that person to us to remove the false gospel that they're, they're uh, spewing or preaching if they're actually people of the church or claim to be people of the church. And that's what he goes on and talks about in verse 13 is about the deceitful, the deceitful workers. And, and for Paul in this right here, and I, fo I didn't focus on that quite enough, but this idea of the deceitful workers, are Paul's really criticizing individuals in Corinth, not because this is a deceiving spirit from the outside, but this deceitful worker the idea of the workers for the kingdom, they're inside the church. They're, they're inside the church. And one of the commentaries talked about them not being outside or not being outsiders, but being undercover agents trying to twist the truth from the inside, as Matthew tells us about appearing as sheep, but being really ravenous wolves. And so that's that's the other key thing. We just need to remember. Stay in scripture, prayer, come to church as much as you can, as often as you can, because in this, in the body is where we strengthen ourselves. We strengthen our knowledge, we strengthen our understanding, and then we can go out into the world and we can take a true gospel and present it to the world. And we will have the love of Christ as we present it so that others will see Christ in you and hear Christ through you that that's what it is and then maybe you're the end of the process and they accept the loving faith of christ through the holy spirit i hope this has been um enlightening and edifying and again if you see me in church um, and i said something that was not maybe as clear as it should have been please i don't get my feelings hurt i sometimes i practice things a certain way and i get them in my head and then i get in front of the camera and i I kind of forget exactly the way I wanted to say it, and it may have, I'm, the wording may have been a little different. So, normally at this time I'd ask you if there are any questions, but uh, nobody's going to have a question. One last thing before we close in prayer. In mine, it's in the, it's on the, it's on the page where it says my mission, and I just want to read these to us because I think these are really key. Yeah, it says, uh, it's next to the voices in, from the church, um, Joni Tana. It says, because we have been saved and transformed by the one true gospel of Jesus, we share it with others in the power of God. And then it has three things. And just and ponder this as you go through the rest, the rest of the, the next week. In what ways will you strive to boast in Christ alone in this world? Second thing, what false gospel or gospels does your group need to confront for the sake of your group and your gospel witness in the community? And I know they're probably referring to the group in the church, but I would ask you, expand the notion of group and think about the group in your living room, family, friends, co-workers, wherever that group is, your oikos, your sphere of influence. Where is that and what false gospels do you need to, in that group, address? And then the last thing, with whom will you share your boast in Christ alone? Who was crucified and raised for the salvation of sinners? Remember, Christ died for us all, for all of his creation. But not all are his children, and it is the job of his children to take the Great Commission to all the nations and baptize. Let me close this in prayer. Father, your power and provision for our salvation through faith in Christ are more than adequate graces shown to us. 
yet you give us so much more. May we never take your grace for granted or seek the easy, the easy life, the easy gospel, the easy situation. Instead, give us the strength of character and the faith through your Holy Spirit to take up our cross and follow your son Jesus into the world that actively opposes him and his word. May we speak the truth of gospel clearly and simply and see your miraculous power at work in us and in our church here at Redbud and in the people we come into contact with. And let us spread your son's loving gospel of salvation, grace, and mercy to all those that we come into contact with. For these things I pray in your son's name. Amen.